What's up, First Thing First listeners? It's your boy, Shay Sharp, co-host of FS1's Undisputed. I wanted to tell you about my new podcast, Club Shay Shay, where we always do something before two something. Each week, I sit down with a guest for a drink and conversation, and as host and proprietor of Club Shay Shay, I've welcomed in esteemed guests such as Snoop Dogg, Floyd Money Mayweather, LeVar Ball, Isaiah Thomas, just to mention a few. Whether I'm talking to an athlete, a musician, an actor, or a lifelong friend, Club Shay Shay is a place where people share inspiring and motivational stories about their journeys to prominence. The new episode drops every Monday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to Club Shay Shay now and make sure you never miss a new episode. Now, back to First Things First. First things first, last night, the King making a big push towards a big MVP. We'll tell you why. Will it be Taysom or will it be Jameis under center in New Orleans come week one? Nick can't believe that's even a question. And Bill Belichick's spending spree continues oh, yeah. yesterday. Good Wednesday morning, everyone. Welcome to First Things First. Jenna Wolf alongside Nick, Brandon Wilds. Nick, Patriots of New, looking on? like Patriots of Old. Gotta say it. No, I don't have to say it at all. I actually don't, and I, yeah. I, I won't. You they, have to say it. I don't have to say it. <laughs> All right, we'll get to everything Dollar Bill did in a bit, but we got to start this morning in Chicago where the Mitch Trubisky era is officially over. Bears signed themselves a quarterback yesterday. That quarterback is Andy Dalton. Bit of a disappointment for Bears fans who undoubtedly had their hearts set on Russell Wilson after Russ listed the Bears as a trade destination. So why no Russ? Well, get this, guys. Bears were reportedly told by Seattle Russ will not be traded, quote, at this time. Last night, Russ, seen all the news of the day, released a hype video, the likes of which nearly, nearly made Nick want to work out. Thank goodness he didn't. Said the fire rises, he captioned the video. Brandon, we'll start with you. What was your reaction to the Seahawks reportedly telling the Chicago Bears they're not trading Russell Wilson at this time? Well, first, before we can even get to that, like, come on, Russ, this video is a little too much. You got like four or five mad scientists <laughs> surrounding you. Come on, man. <laughs> man, just work out. We, uh, we, what are you looking at? Your, your, your resting heart rate? Like, what's going on with Russell Wilson right now? What, man, I love it. This is, this is who Russ is. I mean, it's all about winning. Uh, but this is the Seattle Seahawks and Pete Carroll finally dealing with reality and come into their senses. That's what this is. You have the most, not the most, you have the winningest quarterback <laughs> through nine years in NFL history. Think about that. That's what this comes down to. All these other things we could talk about, offensive line, weapons, defense, championships, through nine seasons, you have the, the winningest quarterback in the history of the game. This goes to what you've been saying wins. for the last couple weeks, Nick. It's like, come on, what are we doing here, Pete Carroll? What are we doing here, Seattle? So now, you know, it, they're up against the fire, and now they got to answer questions, they got to answer calls, and they got to deal with the reality. And now they're like, oh, do we really want to trade them? I don't think it's over, but I think they want more time to think this through, Nick. Well, and I do think that Russ and his agent did them a favor by creating the list that they did. So let's go over those four destinations. Dallas oh, was the one that would have been the easiest. That, that would have been the easiest, right? D Dak for us, figure out a pick on either way. Well, then Dak resigns, they're off the board. The Saints never were a possibility. I said it then, I'll say it now. He might as well have included, if Brandon Marshall got in his ear, you know where you should go? The Brooklyn Nets. I hear. You know, I know you're an offensive guy, but that's all they care about there. It's no problem you don't play defense. They don't either. The Saints were never a possibility because of the money. So then we had Chicago and we had the Raiders. Chicago hasn't had, aside from Brandon's beloved Jay Cutler, an above average quarterback in 70 years. They don't seem to want one, which is why they yesterday was like, ah, Andy Dalton, you're more Bears-ish than Russell Wilson. And it was always going to be hard for the Bears to make a trade package that made sense for Seattle because they couldn't include a quarterback or a pick to get a quarterback. 
So then all that's left is the Raiders. So why would Russ want to go to the Raiders? Well, you could argue they had the best offensive line in football last year. Unfortunately, the Raiders seem dead set on decimating that offensive line because it's all gone. Rodney Hudson, they just cut him yesterday for reasons no one seems to understand. Understand Trent Brown's gone. Rich, Richie Incognito is at least temporarily gone. So unless Russ is going to yep. come up with a new list, Wilds, the leverage has moved to Seattle by the way, Wilds, with Seattle doing nothing. How do you think Russ woke up this <laughs> yeah. morning or when he wakes up and he's like, oh, Trent <laughs> Williams signed for $140 million to stay in San Francisco. And San Francisco might also be adding Alex Mack. And the Chiefs just added Joe Tooney. And we are in the market for Leonard Fournette. So Seattle's just sitting on their hands like, we're, we might not have to do anything. Your own list is oh. getting shorter by the day. So I just, I, I, I feel like part of this is on, it might have been a bad list. Maybe you should have included the Dolphins oh, yeah. on that list. Like, m m maybe it was a bad list to start with, Wilds. So he's either expanding his list or he's going back to Seattle. And I think for Seattle, they stopped the bleeding. But this is a wound that is not going to heal. And the number I want to give you is 800 days. And here's why. On day one of 800 days, Seth Wickersham of ESPN wrote an article. This is 2018. It said, is this the beginning of the end for Kraft, Belichick, and Brady? And everyone lost their minds. Seth was attacked online. Don Yee, Brady's agent, says it's not true. Bill Belichick and the Patriots released a statement about an article saying it's not true. We're focused on winning a Super Bowl. So it was like, all right, not true. It was a big opus, but it's not true. Then two months later, go to the Super Bowl, lose to the Eagles. Then a year later, win a Super Bowl. And then you know what happened 800 days after that article? Brady left. And why did he leave? For everything that Seth said in the article. Belichick's bracing coaching culture, uh, the, the power in the organization, the long-term plan at QB. So even though the Patriots went to two Super Bowls and won one, winning didn't solve anything, Brandon. That wound was opened up and there was nothing the Patriots could do to solve it, short of signing you know, two great tight ends this offseason. But it's raising me, for me to think that Seattle might be like out of the woods right now, but this is not going to end well. Whether it's today, tomorrow, next year, or 800 days later, I think Seattle is eventually moving on from Russ, or Russ is moving on from Seattle. Listen, all of this stuff is political, and as a player and in the media, uh, we, we know this, you gotta be diplomatic. All you gotta do is listen, and listen really closely. So what did they say? We're just not we're not we're not trading him right now. There oh this is still real. The Chicago Bears is still real. I love Red w Rifle. I love what? Andy. Okay, I love Andy Dalton, but that's not what that's not what Chicago wants. They still have everything they need to go get Russell Wilson. It's on Seattle now. Now they're sitting down at the table. What we've been saying for for weeks now, sit with Russell Wilson and figure it out. Like if you want to become a Hall of Fame head coach, if you want to become a Hall of Fame general manager, coach, I mean Snyder, what you got to do is you got to protect this guy. You have to listen to him. If not, it's going to be a sad day in Seattle. We're talking about in Seattle sports history. It's going to feel like Ken Griffey Jr. Oh, yeah. leaving. It's going to feel like the Supersonics leaving. They need to continue this conversation and figure it out. But we're talking about sooner rather than later. I'm telling you right now, Nick, if they don't figure it out now, there's going to be a trade partner here pretty soon. Well, here's the yeah, I, I like that that Brandon's making sure we all know the door is still open. That the at this time doesn't necessarily mean that at this time extends the entire offseason. It might just mean through the rest of month or this month or up until the draft. Right. But at this point, if they were to call in Russell Wilson and say, listen, we want to sit, sit you down and talk about the free agents we're looking at, that's a paltry list. <laughs> like what Rodney Hudson did just become available because the Raiders don't know what they're doing. But, like, who are the great offensive linemen that are still 
out there? Who are these super high impact defensive players that are still out there? Right. The, the position right now, Jenna, that has the most depth of high level players is, I would argue, the position the Seahawks need the least wide receiver. We, I know Galladay's out there, Juju's out there, other guys are out there, but you have DK it's and Lockett. Protection. So, yeah, maybe yeah, adding a third matters. guy would okay. be nice, but Russ, that wasn't on his list. When Russ was talking about what he wants, yeah. he was talking about defensive playmakers and offensive linemen. I don't think he took any shots at all at their pass catchers. You could say tight end is in need. Well, the Patriots are going to run a seven tight end offense, so that's not available to the rest of football. <laughs> so I don't know what I, I I don't know when they sit down with him what they're going to be able to present to him, Jenna. I don't think it's not out of the realm of possibility that maybe Russ doesn't come out with a list of teams, but that it's leaked out there that now maybe he's thinking about a team or linked yeah. to a different team. I think he knows what we know, that, that that group that he originally, that list he originally put out is obviously dwindling. We got to take a turn. Talk some tournament now. Fox Super 6 has you covered. Six contests, one for every round. Here's what you have to do. Download the Fox Super 6 app now. Answer six questions about round one for your shot at a thousand dollar prize as always it is completely Why do free I feel to play like with that we're going to take a break reset we'll be right back right after this this is first things first hey first things first listeners i wanted to tell you about our brand new fox sports app and website foxsports.com reimagined for the modern sports fan go ahead download the new app right now you don't even have to pause this episode every day on the new app and website you'll see the top stories in sports plus a rich world of written content, video, social media, and analytics to give you a 360 degree view of the most important stories of the day. Streaming live TV has never been so easy or elegant. Every Fox Sports game, including all pregame and postgame shows, as well as the televised version of this show, just a click away. For the extra invested fan, we also go deep with real time wagering lines, trending prop bets, win probability, and key player projections. So download the new Fox Sports app or visit www.foxsports.com. Play a little draw to blank now. Let's start with Andy Dalton. He signed a one-year deal with the Bears yesterday. Just one of the quarterback dominoes to fall thus far. But Brandon, the best free agent signing in the last 24 hours was blank. Uh, so not only the last 24 hours, Jenna, but he probably adds the most value. He's probably gonna have the greatest impact out of everybody in free agency. This dude probably, and I don't want, I'm not trying to be disrespectful here. I'm not trying to say, oh, I'm Brandon Marshall. I played in the National Football League and nobody else knows. But this dude, probably 70% of America are those avid, those 90 million avid football fans may not know this guy. His name is William Jackson. He's the cornerback that just left the Cincinnati Bengals and now he's headed Great to player. Washington, the football team. This dude is a dog. This dude is now going to step into a lockdown cornerback. He's up there with Jalen Ramsey. Now, when I say up there with Jalen Ramsey, I mean going into the situation now. He's not Jalen Ramsey, so let me clarify that. But you put him hmm. together with Ron Rivera and also that defensive line. Oh, man, you're, you're not going to have time to throw. I love this situation. He is sign. playing chestnut checkers. It's a great signing. He's a great player. I'm glad you brought him up. I, I'm going to read you guys how my morning started because I have Twitter alerts. Oh. So I woke up about 4.15 this morning, and I see that Schefter had just tweeted the following. Trent Williams discussed deals with the Chiefs and the Bears. The Chiefs wound up, and then the alert's over. I've got to go to actually Twitter read. I'm like, oh, my God, it happened. Tune in Williams. <laughs> The rest of the tweet reads, the Chiefs wound up <laughs> signing Joe Tooney. The Bears signed Dalton and, and Afidi, ensuring the 49ers would keep Williams. God dog it, Schefter. The okie doke. But the answer is Trent Williams. Good contract, too. Six years, $138 million. But for a brief moment there, I thought the Chiefs went from whatever offensive line they had in the Super Bowl to two all pros on the left side. So for a moment, I was happy this morning, and now I'm not quite as happy, but I'm happy for Trent Williams. His holdout, by the way, in Washington works great. Got his way to San Francisco and becomes the highest paid offensive lineman in the history of football. Maybe a lesson for Deshaun Watson, but that's my answer, Wise. Okay, my answer is obviously Hunter Henry, and here's a free piece of advice. 
to every Patriots opponent from here on out. Increase your security. Not for any real dangerous threat. But when Bill Belichick comes on the field after the game, he's not just there to say hi. It's Mr. Steal Your Tight End. So up the security, you got to look like a college football team, how they surround Nick Saban with multiple state troopers. If you've got free agents, get them out of there, because Mr. Steal Your Tight End will be <laughs> on you fast. Dollar bill. On to Antonio Brown now, one of a number of top receivers still available on the open market. See if Tampa can bring him back as well. But Brandon, the free agent you're surprised is still available is blank. Well, Jenna, let's stay right here. The wide receiver position. Okay. Let's stay right here. You guys remember, I think it was 2010, A.J. Green, Dez, Bryant, Demario, uh, Demarius uh, uh, out there in, 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 in uh, Denver. They were up. And then De Demarius Thomas, there you go. And then they start colluding. Every once in a while, the NFL just starts colluding on this one position and try to devalue one position. Right now, it feels like the wide receiver position. Where are the big deals for us? Guys, I'm going to use my platform to advocate for big wide receiver movements and signings. We got Kenny Galladay out there. Why isn't this dude signed yet? This is a big play wide receiver. He's worth $20 million a year. Somebody need to go get him. Last year, he was it was COVID-19, and he had a down year because he was injured, but he took it easy. But if you go back and you see that the, the two years before, over 1,000 yards. But here's the big thing about Kenny Galladay since he's entered the NFL. 2017, average 17 yards of reception, 15 yards of reception in 2018, and then 18 yards, then 16 to follow that up. This dude is a big play wide receiver. The NFL is about getting the ball into the playmaker's hands. This is a playmaker, Nick. Somebody needs to stand up and write the check. Okay, I like that answer. I like my answer more, which is why I picked it. Patrick Peterson. Hey, I don't know if you saw the tweet yesterday. Patrick Peterson's list down to three teams. The Cardinals and two mystery teams. The only insight is the mystery teams Hold on. made the playoffs each of the last two seasons. What are we holding on about? What's wrong, wow. Brandon? Because you know who made the playoffs wow. each of the last Patrick two seasons. Patrick Peterson isn't Kansas signed Chiefs. yet? He's not signed. Oh, my goodness. Future Hall of Pat Famer. Exactly. You know where he's going to sign? He likes the color red, I hear. The Kansas City Chiefs. What insight do I have on that? My heart. That's my insight. Go to Kansas Everyone City, Patrick. Can... We need tell, you. Tell Patty what? to call what? him. Wilds. Tell Patty to call him. Yeah. Because you can't have every, Patty, call every Patty. free agent Patty, go to the call Chiefs. Patty. Patrick, call Patrick. They've only had one every... free agent go to the Chiefs. Yeah. <laughs> They've only had one. Well, they had Tooney. And well, now Peter. What's all. wrong, Wilds? Why is he yeah, going to the Chiefs? Because his name is Patrick and he likes red. That's the that's the insight. Yeah, and winning. And he saying. likes to win. And he wants to win. <laughs> and winning. Give your give your okay. answer. <laughs> Mine's a question to Brandon, the esteemed wide receiver on the panel. Okay. My answer was Juju. And Brandon, I personally mm. like all the charismatic stuff that Juju does. I like the TikTok dances. I like the training of, you know, pulling uh, the rope with the lion of training. But I'm not sure every NFL GM shares that sentiment. Do you think that some of these dances or exploits ended up costing him money? Absolutely not. No. Man, they, they, man, NFL, not for long, short memory, they, they're just all about, what can you do for me now? They don't care about this last year. In okay. the moment, we strapping it up, yeah, but right now, free agency, they don't care about this. All right, Joe Judge, let's go. Joe Judge. <laughs> Joe Judge. <He> was coming. <laughs> All right, we got to talk about the king. LeBron James, clearly not enough on his plate if he can add part owner of the Boston Red Sox to the old resume. Joined Fenway Sports Group as a partner. Looks pretty good in a Red Sox uniform. What? I bet you it's Photoshop. Why is he here? Brandon, LeBron James <laughs> becoming part owner of the Red Sox is blank. <laughs> Jenna, this is chess like. The greatest chess, I'm a big chess fan. I play it every day. I got the app, Chess with Friends. I got a couple boards. It's, got, it's awesome, beautiful game. But you learn a lot about people when you play chess. All right, the greatest chess players in the world, they're able to play 10, 20 moves out, 30 moves out. Like they just got it. They got this thing where they can see into the future. That's LeBron James. He's the first athlete to actually strategize and use tactics to build uh, enterprise, companies. 
So right now, great. Yeah, oh, this is great. Baseball, baseball. No, this is LeBron James playing chess. You know what's going to happen in about maybe, it could be five years. I don't know when he retires, but let's say 10 years. He's going to own an NBA team. There's been a lot of talk about it. Oh, LeBron wants to do yep. this. LeBron wants to do this. This is him taking the next step forward. This is chess-like. And a lot of athletes need to study this dude and how he moves in his camp because these dudes are next level, Nick. Which Brand the only thing Brandon got wrong there is Brandon failed to acknowledge LeBron already owns an NBA team, and that's the Boston Celtics. He took ownership of them in 2012 <laughs> with the 45, 15, and 5. Yeah. So my answer is phase two. Phase one was owning the Celtics. Phase two is owning the Red Sox. Phase three, Boston Bruins, you for sale. Phase oh, yeah. four, Robert Kraft, Ooh. Meek Mill can set up the meeting. They have a, they have a mutual friend. Ooh. Robert Kraft, you want to sell me a piece? Own all of Boston. And all Celtic fans this year, just remember, <laughs> as your team is scuttling along, that you have baseball season coming up. Look forward to the Red Sox. And you know who owns the Red Sox now? LeBron James. Enjoy that, yeah. Celtic fans. I'm so excited and happy for I it. think that's it. I really like that. Then we can just all be New England fans, Nick, because you would have to transfer all of your fan to New England. So it would be a win-win for us. <laughs> hey, I'm going to, my answer is Magic and Tigers. And no, I'm not talking about like a wonderful Las Vegas show. Magic and Tigers for the following reason. Magic Johnson grew up a Tigers fan. And he ended up buying the Dodgers. And he became a Dodgers fan. And no one's like, why'd you buy the Dodgers? You liked the Tigers. Like these people in New England, like, he likes the Yankees. He likes Cleveland. Yeah, it's a business move. He's a, he will now like the Red Sox. It's just like Magic likes the Dodgers. You know, you're not wedded Follow to the, the money. team that you're Follow the money. you're six years old. Come on. Red Sox yeah, he is. Have and he hates the Celtics and he owns them. That's true. Start with the king and stay with the king. Talk about what he did on the basketball court last night. Is he running away with the MVP? To be discussed next, first things first. Hey, first things first listeners. It's Charlotte Wilder here to tell you about my new podcast with Mark Titus called The People's Sports Podcast. It comes out every Thursday and Mark and I take one of the big stories of the week and then we go off on tangents you never saw coming. This might mean that we start talking about the Dodgers winning the World Series and end up wondering if Knicks fans deserve happiness or begin with LeBron's greatness and end up drafting our ultimate beer league softball team made up of old athletes. Whatever it is, the only rule of the show is that it has to be fun and funny because these days we can all use as many laughs as we can get. So check it out wherever you get your podcasts and come down weird sports rabbit holes with us. We can't wait to have you. Now, back to first things first. Back here with Antoine Walker talking Lakers now where the story begins and the story ends with LeBron James. Big night for him. 25-12-12 and 12, and a win over the T-Wolves who, I should mention, have the worst record in basketball. The responsible journalism. That's all it is. I had to mention it. Still a win. Antoine, sure. how much has LeBron's <laughs> performance during AD's absence helped his MVP case? It's, actually, it's, it's definitely made it stronger when you look at the body of work, what he's done so far. Um, this back-to-back -back game, I don't care who you're playing. When you get back-to-back -back triple doubles and he's doing it in an efficient manner, um, 30 minutes he's, he's got it done and, and, and still willing this team to be right in the mix. They still could be the one seed right now with a, with, a, with a deep win streak. So I think LeBron James, you have to give him a lot of credit. Uh, I'm, I'm not ready to give him as the leading candidate right now. Um, I still think it's Embiid. I still think you know Embiid can come back in a reasonable amount of time uh, being he can get back in the next 10 days, you know, 15 days, I still think it's his award to lose. But LeBron James is playing incredible. We got to stop um, devaluing um, a guy who plays back-to-back. -back, well, he could have easily set out against Minnesota, the worst team in the league. But he plays, he gets a triple-double. Um, it's not, we might, may not ever see this again. And we, we have to really enjoy seeing a guy 18 years in and being able to play at the level he's able to play with. So I don't want to devalue that, but I'm not ready to give it to him just quite yet. I'm still got Embiid as the leader. Man, you, Nick, and Chris B, you guys sound like this is a charity award. Like, come on, I know you guys cover basketball <laughs> more than I have, but 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 come on, man. Like, it goes to the most valuable player, LeBron James. Nothing has changed before Valentine's Day. 
to post Valentine's Day. That's when AD went down. Not much has changed. What has changed, though, and, and, it's, and it's a big deal, is the last thing, the win and loss column. Because the precedent was set. In NBA history, you have to win. What they say, what Al Davis say, win, baby, win. If you want to be an MVP, outside of a few exceptions like uh, Russell Westbrook in 2016, 2017 season, where he averaged that triple-double, you got to be a top two seed. And right now, they're trending in the wrong direction. So, yeah, they won last night against the Minnesota Timberwolves. And these last three teams that they played since the break, they're a combined 26 games below 500. So let's not get it twisted as far as like, oh, they're winning, they're maintaining, they're getting back on track. In their next two games, we got Charlotte, we got Atlanta. Well, those two teams are 500. They're supposed to do that. So for me, when you're talking about win, baby, win, and that is the precedent that the NBA has set going back 20-something yep. years, 40-something years, then who we need to be talking about is Joel and B, and, and if he can come back in enough time to maintain what he's already done, what he created. And then James Hart, Harden, this is a real conversation for him. Well, so I agree with you that winning is a massive part of it, which is why it is very, very important. You guys taking me off the screen? What the hell's going on here? That's fine. I'm going to show my sweatpants here pretty soon. Sure. Um, which is why, um, well, I mean, I'm about to make a brilliant point, y'all panning down. It, it, it's a test to see what I'm, if I'm wearing a full suit or not. Um, which is why baby. it's important. Yes, sir. Which is why it's important that only the Sixers and the Jazz have more wins than the Lakers. Additionally, what Brandon's stat panel didn't show, and this is last night it was not the case, but becoming an increasingly large part of LeBron's case is this. The Lakers are the number one defense by a mile in the NBA. The gap between one and two is bigger than the gap between two and ten. And they haven't had Anthony Davis for a bulk of the season. So why have they been great defensively? For all of a sudden... First team all defense 2021, LeBron James. But Kevin Wilds, I have a prediction for you. Looking in my old crystal ball. It's a narrative <laughs> prediction, and this is it. I think LeBron James is going to stay second in the MVP conversation all year. And I think it's going to be a rotating cast of characters ahead of him. It was Embiid. And here in a week or so, you know who's going to replace Embiid because Embiid's going to have missed too much time? James Harden. Joker. And then Kevin oh. Durant's going to come back. And it'll be Harden will be, Harden will oh, be one, LeBron will be two. It was Embiid <laughs> one, LeBron two. Then Harden one, LeBron two. And then KD will come back and so that'll hurt validating Harden. me, So Kevin. then what will happen? And so, so you know what's <laughs> then going to happen? It'll be like, hey, should Giannis be getting more love? Should you look at the Bucs. Yeah, the I'm Bucs will be first or second in the East. Should Giannis be any more love? And then come the last few, and it'll be Giannis won LeBron too. And then come the last few weeks of the season, mark it down. This is the name you're going to be hearing. You know who's actually the MVP? Nikola Jokic. And it's nothing against LeBron. LeBron's having an amazing year, but the Joker needs to be MVP. And it'll be, we'll have a consistent second place guy with a rotating cast of people who we're going to try to argue ourselves into giving MVP over LeBron. That's how this thing's going to play out. It's ludicrous, but I guarantee that's the narrative that's coming. Harden, Giannis, Jokic, with LeBron staying as the stalking <laughs> horse. Okay. Can, can I give you the argument for Joker and you tell me where I'm wrong? Oh, here it is. Okay. Here we go. Just I, I came early. Joker has more points, rebounds, assists, and steals, if you care about steals. He's shooting better from the field, better from three, and better from the line, if you care about the free throw line, which I don't in MVP. He's also played more minutes, so if you're the whole durability thing. He's also played more minutes. But Denver's in fifth place, and the Lakers are in third place. Is that the reason why you eliminate Joker from the MVP, he's not eliminated, but is that the reason why you have LeBron above Joker? Because Joker's winning every one of the major categories that you usually like, but he's not, you know, he's below him on the win column. 
So is that the reason why so you're not giving Joker I'm, a fair shake? I would I'm say. not eliminating Joker from the discussion. He's certainly in the top five. But I am also not going to eliminate one side of the court when I had to listen to everyone in America in 2018 disqualify LeBron James from winning MVP. Why? Oh, my God, he's so bad defensively. Oh, my God, he doesn't even try on that end. When Joker is a turnstile defensively. And LeBron right now is the good. best defensive player on the <laughs> best defensive team in basketball. So, Antoine, like, so that's that, got to that, play a part Is that your position? Is what my position is? Antoine, is that his position? Is that his position? No, when, when, when is the last what? time we crowned somebody MVP because of defense? Well, I would... Well, this is the one thing you got to put in perspective. Giannis last He's played year. 16 games without Anthony Davis. I don't know no, where you guys Giannis rank Anthony ball. Davis, but Anthony Davis probably considered top four or five players in this league when healthy. So he's played 16 games without him. He's a, the team is still in th th third place. They're only two and a half games out of being in first place. And then also, they're on a three-game winning streak. So, Brandon, they're, they're trending up. And LeBron James is not slowing down. <laughs> you can't take for granted. You can't take for granted back-to-back -back triple double. Did you not Matter hear fact, me, Torn? But listen, but how many guys 18 years in are even playing back-to-back -back game? You got to start. LeBron James is separating himself listen. in some of this conversation. Okay, so let's, let's, believe, let's eliminate you know, this sir. conversation. I'm trying to debunk this whole theory that they're trending upwards. That's why I came out with facts. The last three opponents after the All-Star break, they're combined 26 games below 500. So, of course, they're going to get back on track and be on a three-game winning streak. Brandon. And then they're playing Atlanta, then they're playing Sharp. It, it doesn't, Nick, don't talk to me about the greatest player in the world beating up on, excuse me, sorry if I offend some, some, some people. But bums, like, so I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, he's not playing Brandon, against anybody right now. And, okay. and then the other thing. That's fine. And then the other thing is this. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Here's the thing. I, I'm always going to root for the underdog. I'm, the, I'm an underdog. So when I see a team like Kansas City Chiefs playing against, you know, the Buffalo Bills, nine times out of ten, I'm rooting for the Buffalo Bills. I want to see sure. that. And then when I see a great, whether it's Serena Williams, Tiger Woods, and they're going for, you know, their, 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 their you know, uh, something that's never right. been done in sports, a great, one of the greatest feats ever. I want to see it. Why? Because I want to be able to tell my kids and my kids' kids, I witnessed that. You know, I was able to watch Michael Jordan. So, yes, LeBron James, I would love to see it. But at the end of the day, those dudes, they it's, it needs to be right. It needs to be fair. Those dudes go into the gym. They put up buckets every single day. They put in the work every single day. Yeah. So when you look at the statistics, LeBron James is just, he's having a good year. But there's some dudes that's having really good years and phenomenal years, and they're winning. So we can't just say, oh, LeBron James, because he played 18, he's playing, it's his 18th year, and nobody plays back-to-backs, he needs to be, you know, the leading uh, well, uh, uh, MVP no, candidate. I just don't see right. it that way. I agree with you. I don't think year 18 should play a part of it. I do think, though, if you like underdogs and you like greatness, then, I mean, it would, it would change the show drastically, but I've got a team for you. The nobody believes in us <laughs> Los Angeles Lakers because well, you got greatness in LeBron and you've got the, uh, this, in the city of L.A., you, a lot of people think they're not even the best team. They're certainly not the unbeatable greatest collection of talent, super favorite Nets that I've been hearing so much about all year. So, that I mean, I think that territory. actually, I, I think the Lakers should be someone you like. But I do have, you're listing all these terrible teams. <laughs> teams like Indiana, Sacramento, uh, Sacramento again, Orlando, Houston, Go Detroit, the Knicks. You know that list? That's the teams the Nets have beaten yeah, in their 12 of 13 okay. wins that you have okay. been falling all over <laughs> okay. yourself about. But, but yeah. Nick, but just two weeks ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I can't list all the teams, but what we were saying just three weeks ago was, oh my goodness, the Nets, they beat all the great teams, and then they lose to the Minnesota Timberwolves. Then they lose to Golden State. So please, don't That's tell right. me. You're that right the, about that. You know, try to use no, that as an excuse. We beat the best teams.
Some of them. That's right. I'm going to set you guys off. Let's see these medals. I want to get to Nick's NBA medals. Jimmy Butler had a big night. 28 as the Heat beat the Cavs. It's five in a row for them. One of the hottest teams in basketball right now. No medal, though, for Jimmy Butler. Nick, who did win a medal last night? Well, by the way, speaking of Jimmy Butler, America, give it another four weeks, and Kevin Wilds is going to come up with a full screen about why Jimmy Butler's actually the MVP. Mark it down. Nikola Jokic today, Jimmy Butler a month from now. Bronze medalist, uh, LeBron Raymond. 25, 12, and 12, only 14 shots, and a win in a back-to-back -back over the Minnesota Timberwolves. Silver medalist, Zach Levine. Zach Levine has 40 points on 20 shots in under 32 minutes. He's the first Bulls guard to ever do that. I'll say that again. The first Bulls guard to ever do that. Does that hurt Michael Jordan's GOAT argument? Some are saying yes. Gold medalist, Damian Lillard. No one's ever done yes. what Dame did. 50 points, 10 assists on 20 shots. Wow. That stat line has never been duplicated in NBA history. In other words, it's something Michael Jordan also never did. Does that hurt Jordan's GOAT argument? Some people are saying yes. Yeah. Wilds, there it is. Your bronze, silver, and gold. It's a strong podium today. Strong podium. It's a great podium. Great podium. It's not that weekend podium. Sometimes we get that Thursday podium. Oh, no, there's another award I have to hand cut, out. Buddy. Congratulations to the Rockets. They have made a historic loss yesterday, tying their franchise record of 17 consecutive losses, tied the San Diego Rockets. I didn't even know the Rockets were in San Diego. I thought it was a Houston-based kind of like NASA thing. Uh, also, this punctuated by Sterling Brown going for, oh, no. No, and Trey Young gives him a little like, what are you doing, dude? We're up big. It's the fourth quarter, a few seconds left. I was trying to be nice, but now I'm going to drain a three. So congratulations, when Rockets. Go when for that the record. Play them? 18 consecutive losses. They're probably on their <laughs> schedule the in the next couple them. weeks, too. <laughs> Brandon's so fired up about the schedule. Uh, we got to head up to New England. Bill Belichick's handing out big bags. Can the Pats turn the spending spree into success? We're going to break all that down for you next. First things first. San Diego Rockets Wild was about... Back here, first things first, let's head up to Foxborough, where Bill Belichick, clearly not done spending, brought in tight end Hander Henry yesterday, three years, 37 million. Boy, Belichick loves his tight ends. Cam, I'm sure, loves all the new weapons. And Hall of Famer Julian Edelman just loves love, apparently posted this with the I caption, Boston Tea Party. Tea. Funny guy, Jules. Yes. Funny guy. <laughs> uh, we got funny guy Greg Jennings with us now. All right, Greg. You think these new look Patriots can be one of the top ranked offenses in the AFC this season after adding Hunter Henry? I think the Patriots are going to look really good this year as far as being a top ranked offense. Uh, that's to be seen. That is definitely to be seen. I don't want to go that far. I love the pieces, love the acquisitions. Obviously, the two tight ends and John o. Smith, who's a <laughs> tremendous tight end, can both catch the ball and, and pass block. And then Hunter Henry, we all know what he can do as well, adds another dimension. But uh, the two receivers, I think it, it, that's – that's what I want to see most. Uh, Nelson Aguilar and Kendrick Bourne, a good route runner, and a Nelson Aguilar that can stretch the field. But for Cam Newton, and this is important, when Cam was successful and when Cam has had his best years, it was with Greg Olson. It was with that tight end running down the middle, getting open, creating that that space in the seams and allowing him to then work outside, but inside out. And I think that's what you see the Patriots doing. They're putting together a roster um, around Cam Newton's abilities and what he's had success with, what he's had comfort with. And I think this is going to work. But it's all about, again, going back to Cam Newton, how can he take that next step? He's going to be with the team the entire offseason this year. He's hungry. Obviously, he has something to prove, not only to all of us out that in media, in, in the league, but himself. He wants to make sure that he doesn't, end his career the way that we saw last year. So I like this team. I don't think that they're going to be one of the top offenses in the National Football League. No. No. I mean, I, 
this question was a bit of a trap. Like, let's not get ahead of ourselves. We were terrible <laughs> last year. Uh, well, we don't need to be top ranked. It's like if you win a little bit of money at the blackjack table, just be happy. Don't be like, we should buy the Raiders. Should we buy the Raiders? We're winning. Like, just relax. Just be happy that you're better than you were yesterday. Don't have these lofty dreams. Like, we're better than the Chiefs. We're not. But here's the thing. Bill Belichick and Josh McDaniels, got some weapons. They got their weapons back. And now it's a real puzzle because yesterday on this show, everyone said, oh, you got some home goods wide receivers. You got Nelson Aguilar and Kendrick Bourne. Where's your number one? Ah, and Greg said it. It's inside out. It's, out, it's, it's, it's inside out. You start with the tight ends and go out because that's what Brady and Belichick loves to do. And as Greg said, that's what Cam likes to do. We had great, great production from the tight end. And then, <coughs> uh-oh, last few years, 36 yards, uh-oh, two touchdowns versus almost 15. So, Brandon, I like the move, and I like this the inside-out philosophy. For you, does it make more sense now, the wide receiver signings, versus yesterday when you're like, ah, I don't know, these guys aren't really, like, elite, elite. You were nice to them, but you weren't, like, they weren't top-notch. But does it make more sense to you now that you see the full puzzle? No, absolutely not as far as, like, top-ranked okay. offense. No. But efficiency, yes. So he even got Hall of Famer Julian Edelman, your guy, tweeting out. Back. There's not going to be a lot of balls that. coming your way. Greg Jennings, Greg Jennings was 100% correct. You know, when Cam Newton's at his best, he's comfortable throwing to the tight end. You look at Greg Olson. But here's the deal here. All right, and I want to be clear here to make sure I answer the question. top rank offense, no. Efficient offense, can they be probably the most efficient offense? Absolutely. Why? Because it now comes down to coaching. We're talking about coaching on, 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 on the biggest level. Coaching is going to be on display week in and week out with the New England Patriots. We crushed, and I know I've been crushing Bill Belichick all year for being a terrible general manager. And Nick, you talked about it a little bit yesterday. But now as a coach, it's undeniable his place in history as the GOAT. It's undeniable that he is one of the greatest okay. offensive minds, defensive minds, special teams mind, and then game management uh, uh, when, when you talk about coaching out there. So when you see how this team is set up, what you're going to see is go back to 2011 and different Broncos. They had Tim Tebow, that guy right there, Josh McDaniels. Josh McDaniels used Tim Tebow to go to a playoff. If you look at his stats, it wasn't great, but they were efficient because they played complementary football. They played smart on the offensive side. They ran the ball, and then they took shot plays. And then on defense, they were good. In special teams, they were good. They didn't hurt themselves. They didn't have pre-snap penalties. Then you move to 2013, 2014, Colin Kaepernick, the San Francisco 49ers, pistol offense. That's what you're going to see play really good defense and how all this works together. And then you can go to the Baltimore Ravens the last two and a half years with Lamar Jackson. Really good on defense. They're, you know, offensively, they're explosive in the running game. You know, they need to fix that, that passing game. But they've been in the playoffs the last, what, two and a half years. Lamar Jackson was the MVP. So I say that because it's more about coaching and Bill Belichick. Now it's going to he, he has to has his greatest year ever at the coaching position. But he also has Matt Patricia back as the defensive coordinator and Josh McDaniels obviously holding it down as the offensive coordinator. So I think they're going to be super efficient going into next year. All right. So we all agree they're not going to be, you know, a top five offense even in the AFC. But I do, so since that's answered, I do think we need to address the inside out part and then also how they got here. Because that graphic Wild showed is accurate, but I think it needs a little bit of context because I hear a lot of folks being like, oh, remember how dynamic the offense was when we had two tight ends? Yes, but those two tight ends were for a bulk of that time, <laughs> arguably, the greatest tight end ever in Rob Gronkowski. And a, I, I know we don't the talk greatest. about him because of the circumstances of how his life ended and his career ended, but Aaron Hernandez right. was a magnificent football player. And so you had, yes. the, yep. you had a absolutely dynamic, unguardable combination in Gronk and Hernandez. And while I like John U. Smith and Hunter Henry when healthy has shown flashes, that is not Gronk and Hernandez. Greg, I also think it's instructive to talk about how and why the Patriots got here because it speaks to Brandon's point about Bill Belichick, the GM, not holding up his end of the bargain. 
They drafted two tight ends in the third round last year. Those two tight ends had five catches, and so now they're signing two of them. They Ooh, traded brutal. a second-round pick for Mohamed Sanu and drafted Nikhil Harry in the first round. Neither has worked out at all. That's why you get Aguilar and the other kid who dove for the pylon, whose name Born. I'm now forgetting. Uh, it, Kendrick Bourne, Bourne. Kendrick Bourne. Thank you, Wilds. The, it, it, like, that's how you got here. Aside from their punter, Jake Bailey, the last pro bowler the Patriots drafted was Jamie Collins in 2013. Oh, that <laughs> is how you got here. Not just because Brady left. It's because Bill Belichick, the GM, Greg, has not done a good job in selecting players through the college draft. And so now you have to go on a spending spree. I do think that is part of this story as well that has to be told. You're 100% correct, Nick. And, and again, this is why I say um, it is an inside-out deal, and it's a lot of pressure that's going to be put on Cam Newton because it looks yes. to me that they are yes. really supporting what he does well. And so with that being said, yes, Josh McDaniels is going to have great. to do a terrific job of scheming, creating opportunity for all of these guys. We know how he likes to create these uh, just week-by-week plays and opportunities for based on what he sees on film, but can they execute? Yes, they were able to run the ball last year, but primarily because of how great Cam was running the ball. Can they run the ball, turning the ball, turning around and handing it off to a running back, establish some of that, some of that uh, balance that's needed to be successful? Because I don't think that we're going to see the Cam Newton that we've seen with his connection with Greg Olson. I don't think that that's what we're going to see. I think we don't need to see that if they're able to run the ball effectively, both with Cam Newton as well as uh, with their running backs. But this team, there's no number one guy. I think this is the way that Bill Belichick likes to run his, his offense, his teams. I don't want egos. I want work guys. I want guys that's going to bring their lunch pail together and just go after it every single week, every single day. That's what they're getting. I think that's such a great point. You see now what this does nice. for Cam Newton if you do put weapons around him. The pressure is now on him. All right, so it seems like the Pats have a quarterback in Cam. Do the Saints. Well, they have two quarterbacks. Will Jameis or Taysom be the guy come week one? First things first. Nick says next. Back here talking the New Orleans Saints now. It's been a busy offseason, especially at quarterback for the Saints. First, Drew Brees retires. Then they give Taysom Hill a fake extension. Then they bring back Jameis Winston for a year. It's like drama classes are on Saturday, guys. Head coach Sean Payton was asked yesterday who his starting quarterback will be. Take a listen to what he had to say. Are you set at the quarterbacking position? I think we are. I think we are. And, and look, there, there'll be a few calls we make, but our goal coming into the offseason was to obviously re-sign Jameis. Taysom played for us in four games last year and let those guys go to work. And, 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 uh, and I'm excited about it. I'm excited about those two. Now, there, there, there are a few things that, that may still be out there, but I, I, I see those two competing for this position. Oh. Already did actually mm. leave the door open, but Greg Jennings back with us now. Greg, who should Saints fans be rooting for to win the quarterback competition, Jameis or Taysom? Well, to be honest, I don't think they really have to root for either one because we're going to see both of these guys. Um, they, we, these Saints fans, they know what they got with with Taysom Hill. He's not your pass throwing quarterback. He's more of a football player that can just get things done for you at the position, but Jameis Winston, I believe, is their guy. He should be the guy. If I were to say, yes, Saints fans, we're going to root for a guy, it's Jameis Winston because he has all the potential to be an elite quarterback. There you go. He just throws the ball away too often. <clears throat> if he can eliminate the turnovers, Jameis Winston is your guy. There is no real battle royale here like go. i think you're gonna see Taysom hill you're gonna see him because he adds a dimension defensively for guys to where they have to scout and they have to prepare 
on on numerous am- uh, levels. But Jameis Winston, with what he possesses, his ability, his stature, his ability to throw the ball down the field, get the ball in position, he just has to be more accurate, timely, and not throw the ball away, period. Okay, Greg, you sound like me yesterday, and, and, and I, I, I didn't feel good about it. You know, we watch film, we go out to practice, and, you know, we have 12 periods, whatever, out there for two hours. And then the first thing we do, we go inside, cold tub, hot tub, get something to eat. Then we go right into meeting rooms and we watch the film and coach break us down, critique it. Well, I did that on the show yesterday. And one of the things I did on the show yesterday, I was like, well, I might lose all my credibility because I'm about to talk up glowingly about Mitch Trubisky and Jameis Winston. But I sounded like you. It was like, if, 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 if. That's not confident. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what confidence is. So I'm going to say it right now, Nick. Jameis Winston will be the starting quarterback of the New Orleans Saints, and he gives there them the best <laughs> opportunity to win, and oh, they're going to compete for that division 100%. When you look at 2019, 5,100 yards, 33 touchdowns, I got the 30 picks out there, but you just sat behind two oh. <laughs> Breeze for an entire year. And what did Demario Davis say? I said, he said, the one thing that I'm going to remember about Drew Breeze is the process, like what his routine, how he got to Sunday. You're with Drew Brees, Sean Payton. You have to be able to take something from there to take those 30 interceptions in 2019 down in round 10. If you do that, we are cooking, baby. I'm telling you right now, Jameis Winston is the guy, and the New Orleans Saints can be a better team and more scarier team next year. Well, they will be. Ain't no more ifs. Ain't no more ifs with Jameis Winston. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. All right. So Jameis Winston is the guy. <laughs> Whether or not Brandon and Greg are right about him being able to fix things, he's still the guy. And I'm going to explain why. All right, so my wife collects little pieces of African art to put around the house. And she had just bought recently a fan, like it looks like a fan, to hang on the wall. And it was missing. And I was like, where is, where is this? And the other day, I was cleaning out my seven-year-old daughter's backpack, and this piece of art was in her backpack. And I said, what are you doing? This is show and tell. She said, oh, no, this is a fan. I'm like, yeah. She said, it gets hot in school in my mask, so I use it as that. I said, that's not what it's there for. <laughs> that is using Taysom Hill as your quarterback. It is, it is technically, well, he's a quarterback. Yeah, but now you are using all of its actual utility. You are wasting the value of it. The value of Taysom Hill is all the other things he does, and he can throw a little bit. But if he is your starting quarterback, Wilds, you can't let him play receiver. You can't let him play running back. You can't let him play special teams because he can get hurt. And so now you are getting a worse quarterback that you spent a lot of money for and not getting the value from him. So Jameis is your quarterback. Taysom is your gadget guy, and you try to make it work. It's the only option for them, or else it's just a wasted asset because he's called a quarterback that you want to use him as. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, for your consistency. Because, I don't know if everyone heard it, there was a wicked betrayal on the show that just happened. Could I see Brandon Marshall on the screen, please? Brandon, (laughs) why did I go to the tattoo parlor and pay $1,200 to have ball security is job security, yours on mine, <laughs> tattooed on my lower back. Not right because there. Because you told me that that was a mantra to live by. And then fast yeah. forward, fast forward six months, and, and Jameis Winston can throw 30 interceptions in your ride for Poor Baker Mayfield throws one interception in a 48-point game, and you tear the guy apart. So the real question is this. Knowing, knowing that Jameis has to work on the interceptions, can Jameis still be confident enough as a quarterback to get out there and care free enough, like, I got to let it loose, we're gonna, I need to throw the ball around. I got to do my thing. No, don't let it loose. No, ball security we don't want you to let it loose. Is, ball security is job security. No. But is he going to play Reel so it tight in. that it makes him less effective? No, he's going to be more efficient. I saw this with uh, uh, Josh McCown. It was the first time in my, in my career where I understood how valuable the quarterback position was. He and Coach Mark Trustman 
was connected at the hip. He was there every single day. He was the first one in, the last person out. And he was a part of the game plan. Even when Jay Cutler was he, Jay Cutler was our starting quarterback, and he was sending stuff to Jay Cutler at 8.39 p.m. Like, hey, this is what we're thinking about installing. How do you feel about it? Jay Cutler goes down. Our offense starts being more efficient and taking off. We are the now the number one offense in that span. Josh McCown throws 13 touchdowns, one interception. And what I saw him do was literally work the process. So when you see Jameis Winston, this dude has everything physically. A lot of times we don't get what we need mentally in that type of coaching. So now you put him under the tutelage of Drew Brees and Sean Payton for a year. And seeing how you can work the process, because all Drew Brees do, literally, is drop back, and within a millisecond, he knows where he's going with the ball. Greg, you know this. As a wide receiver, you see backside, we got 20 lows in the game, 75 plays. Why do we get those lows? Because we know where the ball's going. If I know where the ball's going, then you should know where the ball's going. Pre-snap is everything. So if you have the arm talent, and then pre-snap, you're able to dissect the defense and say, it's cover three. My cover three beaters to here, my cover two beaters here eliminates the one side of the field now all you're doing is working a high low off the wheel backer to safety so if the wheel backer drops throw it here it's literally that simple so when he throws picks that's why all of us talking here it's football talking here is like what are you doing because it's not that difficult so if he can get that part where he literally drops back sees cover three I got high low I got a smash route so if that cornerback drops I just throw it right here right now and literally he got to do it in, in a split second so that's why I believe he can do it is because of the coaching. And it's a, I, I know it's a big if, but I got to stay with confidence. He's going to do it. There He's going to do it. I like it. Yeah. You, know what, you know what I also like? This hung on the wall not actually being used by my daughter in class like this. Like, what are you doing? Do you know how much this thing costs? This is Taysom Hill as a quarterback. Not what you're there for. Not actually what you're there for. Alvin <laughs> Kamara. <laughs> yeah, that's Speaking right. Speaking of quarterbacks, hey, seems like Russ is staying in Seattle. We'll tell you why his options are dwindling. First things first. For the first time in 11 years, WWE Hall of Famer Edge competes in a match on SmackDown. Plus, Sasha Banks collides with Nia Jax in a championship showdown. It's an all-new Friday Night SmackDown, live at 8 Eastern on Fox. All right, let's talk some Patriots now. Dollar Bill, that's what they're calling Bill Belichick up there in New England. Spending machine. Yesterday, signed tight end Hunter Henry, part of his master plan to retool that roster, maybe build around Cam Newton or whoever they're going to have under center. Henry joins fellow tight end Johnny Smith, receivers Nelson Aguilar, Kendrick Bourne. Look at this list on that offensive side. On defense, you got Judon Mills as well as a pair of defensive tackles. Hanukkah coming early for the Patriots this year. So, Nick, what message do you think the team's sending with their free agent spending spree? Well, I, I think it's the message is twofold. One is they're not tanking. They're not, you know, this isn't a multi-year plan to end up with a top three pick to get a, their next franchise quarterback. They think they can compete. They think they can compete for that division right now. They're not terrified of the Bills Mafia as they shouldn't be terrified of the Bills Mafia. So that is a good thing for Patriot fans. A bad thing, and I want to throw it to Kevin Wilds because he's our resident Patriot fan, is this is a tacit admission by Bill Belichick that Brandon's analysis of him has been spot on, which is a plus head coach, not very good general manager, at least over the last half decade. Because they drafted two tight ends last year, and now they signed two tight ends. They dra In the third round, by the way, they drafted those tight ends. They drafted a wide receiver in the first round. They traded a second-round pick for Mohamed Sanu. Now they signed two wide receivers. They have not drafted a pro bowler other than their punter since 2013. Jamie Collins. Seven drafts, zero pro bowlers, aside from Jake Bailey. And I wonder if Jake Bailey made the Pro Bowl last year just because he was punting so damn much because the offense was so bad. <laughs> so it's, it, it, you're happy that they got better, but it's because they had so many holes to fill 
because they have so many misses in the draft over the last five years, Wilds. Yeah, but I, am I supposed to be super concerned about the lack of, like, pro bowlers that we drafted? I don't know. When we're, when we're hanging banners still? Like, maybe. And then I know I think but the whole thing that banners. Bill Belichick, well, we're going to we'll start again. We'll start soon. What if oh, you're saying over the last ha- oh, over the last decade? Yeah. The ladders. Um, sure. But here's the thing, Nick. I don't understand. I think there's been a lot of criticism to Bill Belichick, and it's been an easy to take a shot at the guy because of the lack of wide receiver production and the lack of tight end production. And people always point to DK Metcalf, even though everybody missed on DK Metcalf. But the guy for 20 years kept retooling and kept restocking and kept the Patriots in contention for two decades then there was one gap year which was which also we had the most opt-outs and the knives were just out and now i think he's like bill belichick's like put the knives away we are now reloaded with cast space and we are going to come back so i feel brandon that the bill belichick criticism of him being a bad gm he's taking it right now and throwing it out the window with all these signings No, it's real. Like, people who, if you watch the game and you really pull back the layers, you can see some issues there. It's not, it's, it's, it's valid criticism. Why? Because you had Tom Brady. You had one of the greatest, one of the greatest athletes ever. We're not just talking about in, 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 in football. We're talking about in all of sports, leadership, being his humility to be able to sit in the front row and let Bill Belichick, let Bill Belichick dog curse him about practice about an interception when this dude's already won four super bowls so so that was the biggest mess because it was an attractive destination he didn't have to participate in the business of the nfl the way he has to do now he's never spent this much and this year he spent what 250 million dollars in, in guaranteed money or just in, in just in free agency whatever the number is that's double the size of uh, the amount of mo- amount of money that he spent in any Years that you know the last nine ten years, so it's it's, yeah. it's ridiculous to think about Bill Belichick as a really good general manager because he hasn't been a good general manager. Here's the deal, Nick. This is the message. The message is this: This is Bill Belichick saying, "Guys, I know I'm not a great general manager, uh, but as a head coach, watch me work." All right, look how he's positioning himself. These are good players. They'll make a, he, they'll make them better. But this is us saying, I'm going to show you mastery at the coaching job. All right. I got Matt Patricia back at defensive coordinator. I got a genius, little boy wonder, uh, 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 Josh McDaniels. And watch me work. This this team's going to look like the 2011 Denver Broncos from an offense perspective. That was Josh McDaniels with Tim Tebow. 2013, 2014, <laughs> studied Colin Kaepernick and what they did with Greg Roman. Two, last year, 2018, the second half of the season, 2019, last year, you see the Baltimore Ravens. This is going to be complimentary football. Really good on defense. And then on our offensive side we're going to be efficient are we going to be a high powered offense are we going to be throwing it all over the field are we going to be averaging 400 yards a game no they're going to be efficient they're going to play complimentary football and you're going to see those three uh uh, minds come together and do something efficient that's what we're going to see at a new england patriots moving forward yeah I think, I think that's exactly right. Jen, I heard you. You, wanna, you What did you want to say there? And, the, I, you and know, I can I, respond? I'm listening, I'm listening to what you're saying, Brandon, and I feel like everything is true, but it should be all, it's all predicated on Cam Newton coming back and be able to keep everything glued together. It's all predicated on Cam being healthy, Cam being the guy, because it seems like it, it's going right. to be him now with all these weapons around him, and are all these weapons enough to bring him past what, eight touchdowns last year, Nick? Va- valid. The only question, the only question to mark about Cam Newton is his arm. So we can talk about that, you know, for oh. days. That, that that's it. That's a valid point there. But at the end of the day, they didn't have any tight ends. They didn't have any wide receivers. Their offensive line. Okay. There was problems there. I don't know if it was but because dude. of Cam Newton pre-snap not being able to set the protection in the scheme. But there was free runners at the quarterback smashing Cam Newton. Play after play after play. Defensively, it was a huge drop. So now you retool in this way, and now the coaching can now come in and put this team in position to be back where they were. This is a team that was always smart. There wasn't a team that always had the biggest names and the greatest players. This was a team that was always smart and efficient. And and here's the other thing, and I don't want to get too in the weeds on how the NFL salary cap works, 
but you are allowed to roll over cap space. It's not like it's use it or lose it, meaning if the Patriots wanted to finish this offseason with $50 million extra in space, and next year the cap was $200 million, for the Patriots it would be $250 million because you can roll over unused space. Why do I say that? Because that speaks, if Belichick thought they were screwed at the quarterback position entirely, he wouldn't have gone on this spending spree. He would have waited a year, the money would have still been there, and then he would have spent the money once the quarterback is more settled. So whether, Jenna, you agree with it or not, he thinks that they are going to be okay at the quarterback position. But I, I, I understand Patriot fans and Wilds will be the vessel for this, getting upset with the idea of what do you mean Bill Belichick isn't a good GM? He, he's won all these championships. We are always in contention with him running things. He obviously had a great run of draft picks, whether it's Brady or Gronk or Hernandez or the value he got on those guys, and of key free agent signings and trades. But he's been in a dry spell, and part of that dry spell has been not only missing in the draft, but also very similarly to the other GM in Boston, Danny Ainge, never willing to lose a trade never willing to overpay. And sometimes you've got to be willing to overpay. You've got to be willing to potentially lose a trade. And now he has to do that for the, the very first time. It, exactly. And now yeah. for the first time, he's having Jenna to overpay to get people in there.